That's right. It's a special live edition of the Sick Podcast Recruits Draftcast. We are here. It's Sunday. It's beautiful outside, and we are looking forward to your comments. We're going to be talking about David Reinbacher, obviously AHL debut, and Grant, you were there to witness it, so we're going to get your thoughts on that. Uh, it's been a crazy week for the Laval Rocket. Two wins and two games against the Belleville Senators, both of them three to two, which means they passed them in the standings. So we're going to talk about Logan Mayu. We're going to talk about Justin Barron, some of the new guys. And obviously yesterday, uh, Boston College defeated Boston University, uh, <laughs> largely in part to Jacob Fowler, another Habs prospect. So obviously we got to touch on him. But the focus today is going to be David Reinbacker. We want to hear your thoughts. Feel free to chime in in the comments. We'll bring them up at some point. But in the meantime, let's get started. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast. The Sick Podcast. Recruits Draft Cast. And with the first overall selection in the 2023 NHL Draft, the Chicago Blackhawks are very proud to select from the Regina Pats, the Western Hockey League, Connor Bedard. The sickest NHL Draft and Scouting Podcast. It's gonna be sick. That's right. Producer Shane here, as always, joined by fantastic Grant McCag by my side. Grant, how are we feeling today? Excellent. Excellent. I would it's hope time, so. I mean, you, you got fantastic. quite the treat. Yeah. yeah, you got quite the treat on Friday. It's it, it's fantastic, just as you said. Not there you go. Me, yeah. you know, everything's fantastic. I went <laughs> down to, uh, yeah, I went down to Belleville, and of course, uh, you know, you get close to the St. Lawrence Seaway, snow, you know. Um, I, it was one of those, uh, I mean, it wasn't as eventful as Rocco's trip to Toronto two weeks ago. I didn't, Hard to I didn't have a flat tire or anything, but back on the 401, you know, with transports passing you and running out a windshield washer on the way home and ended up, I, I, I made it to Kingston and I, I crawled up the 15 Smith's falls, took the back, took the back way from there. I wasn't going on the 401 any further, but. Brought back a lot of memories and, uh, you know, why I don't, uh, you know, if someone offers me a, a full-time scouting job mm. at my age. Uh, I don't know. I may not, I may just say, no, I appreciate it, but I'm going to stick to the video scouting and recruits. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but it was all worth it. It yes. was, uh, it was great to see Laval make the comeback. Uh, Reinbacher to tie it up and uh, Mayu with that beauty wow. in overtime. So uh, very sweet. And I I watched the game last night on AHL TV or whatever. And, you know, with those frigging uniforms, it's hard to make out the uh, numbers, you know. So I was really glad that I got to see the first game in person and knew every shift. It doesn't help that all the defensemen have four you know, like uh, true. That's true. Trudeau yeah. has four. You know, you can only see the four on some of them. Mayu has four, and it's Gallopo has four. They're all tall Ryan too, Baker. so you can't you can't just you know look at oh, the height differences. They all look, they all look the same. Well, man. sometimes you know, I mean, you gotta you know, I keep in mind that Reinbacher is a right defenseman, so that mm -hmm. helps. But still, you know, uh, sometimes it, you can't tell when you're watching the the HL TV uh telecast so i hope uh, rds picks up a few more of these and it's a little clearer uh the rest of the games that i have to see on on tv that's it that's it it might be uh the belleville you know situation there it doesn't i mean yeah. from what i saw it looked like a community center that, or that arena it looked pretty bad yeah it's it, it's an uh, intimate cozy yeah the way a real estate agent would uh you know, describe it. Um, it was kind. pretty cool, though. Uh, the the Laval fans that were there, I don't know if they outnumbered them, but they certainly outshouted them. Yeah. It was like uh, Team Canada 72 when they're, you know, only 3,000 were in the arena in Moscow, but they they were way louder than the, you know, yeah. all the Moscow fans. What? Cheer for your team? You know, what are they doing? You know, go Canada, go. But yeah. it was go Rocket, go was very loud at you know the the Belleville fans tried to counter with go sends go but it just it got uh 
drowned out by the uh, the very vocal uh, Habs fans that that showed up for the yeah. for Reinbacher's debut, and it was it you know it was almost like a home game. So that I think that helped spur them, especially once they scored that that first goal finally, because the first two periods, it was boring. Like there weren't mm-hmm. a lot of chances for either team. And, you know, I thought I might fall asleep on the way home because I was already almost nodding off. But uh, third period was ultra exciting. And the and then the overtime was great. Oh, wow. So Yeah. So, I mean, let's get into it, right? You yourself and, and the Laval fans that made the trip got quite the treat. Obviously, David Reinbacker making his, his much awaited AHL debut and he impressed obviously the big goal right but overall let's talk the whole three periods all three and a half let's say um <laughs> including the overtime but what stood out most to you like what what looking at him you're like okay this <laughs> he's already elite at doing this or that really impressed you whatever well there were several things but right off the bat um rangy you know, it was the first thing that I tweeted. My first impression, Rangy, it just uh, covers a lot of turf out there. It just, uh, or ice, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, uh, you know, he's he's at one si- on one side of the ice by the by center, one, uh, one second, and three seconds later, he's along the boards on the other side checking a guy, you know, like he just – his range uh, with that long stick, he's got a, he's got a very long reach and a long stick. Mm -hmm. And then the mobility on top of that, just, uh, he's going to be an excellent one-on-one defender. He already is, but just as he develops here, it's just going to get better and better. Um, It's funny. I was standing beside two NHL scouts and, you know, I asked them for their thoughts at, at the uh, intermission and the first, the first thing uh, the the fellow beside me said was rangy, you know. So the exact he had got the exact same impression that I did. But um, really good stick, active stick gets his gets his uh, blade on a lot of pucks. Um, very smart, poised. I love his confidence. Like uh, he, uh, he when they were down in the third period. He went on offense, and as you saw by that, you know, the game-tying goal. Wow. Like, for a 19-year-old kid in his first pro game, you know, coming from Europe, smaller ice, uh, I mean, it was it was just uh, great to see that he wanted to take things into his own hands. You can tell that mm-hmm. he, he wants to be a difference maker. And, I mean, we saw it at the development camp too, right, how badly he yeah. wanted to score a goal. And impress the fans, you know, say, hey, I am a great pick after all, you know, maybe I'm not Michkov, but I'm, uh, you know, I'm a defenseman that is going to score some goals. It's kind of cool because he only scored three goals, I believe, this year in Cloton. And then he comes over here and he's on a 41 goal pace. You know? <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's kind of cool. Yeah, and that's it. I mean, we also have some some footage of him, so we can play that while we while we keep talking about David. But um, sure, he like what stood out to me, like when we talk about the goal, right? The confidence that he has. This is his first pro game, and he's already pulling toe drags, uh, <laughs> just sniping. Yeah. And and he had the passing opportunity there on the two on one. Obviously, I think I think he made the right decision by shooting, uh, but he he could have passed right if. Often you see that with with younger players who don't really have that confidence yet. So uh, the fact that he was able to trust himself and shoot it shows a lot already. Um, he could have pulled a slough. You're, you could have pulled a slough, you're saying? Exactly. And... That's, you know, without saying a name, that's who I was referring to. But <laughs> you know what? He has he has improved in that aspect, right? Dr. Schott has uh, has kind of given him that that swagger back, and he, he trusts himself. But yeah, uh, that, that really impressed me, right? It, obviously, fans, it, it would have been foolish to expect something like that from a first game. So it, it, it was very, very surprising and impressive. But I don't know if surprising is the right word, right? Because we know he's a, he's a, a top five talent. That's why he was selected there. So, anyways, right. I, I was I was thoroughly impressed. But from from your point of view, right, you were there in person. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, aside from what you thought he did really well, is there anything that kind of stood out of like, okay, 
maybe he needs okay. to work on that or whatever. Well, I was hoping to go over a few of these things as it went along, but you talked through the first minute and a half here. So um, <laughs> he got to, like, a, if you backed it up there, the second last one, he got, he got cross-checked right in the teeth, right? And that was kind of like, okay, here's your introduction to the AHL, you know. Welcome to the AHL, Rook. You're going to be a lot more of this. He went to the bench and he was holding his mouth quite a bit. But the very first shift, unfortunately, again, you uh, you were chatting. Uh, but I wanted to point out the fact that uh, he was way over on the other side. And I, you know, I think his first two or three shifts, when when the guys were coming up the ice, he was like basically on on the you know his defense partner side of center and you know i got thinking well the rink's 15 feet wider in europe right so he was probably just out of you know being used to he was seven and a half feet over further than he should have been right mm -hmm. so uh but that got adjusted i think the the coaches uh you know said hey dave you know play in your own side buddy you know <laughs> I mean, it's bad enough that you got to get over to the boards to check the guy, but when you're already starting on the wrong side, uh, it was kind of funny. But, he, you know, you can see by all of these uh, highlights just how rangy he is. It's hard to get around him, you know. Last night he had a couple of – uh, yesterday's game he struggled a little more, but for a AHL debut, it was almost flawless. It was just mm -hmm. really nice to see, like – you know, there were a couple of minor turnovers, you could say, but nothing to cost the team. And uh, he was just uh, poised, so poised for his age. Um, I love his outlet passes. And when he rushed with the puck, he was, uh, you know, he got to open ice and, and made nice passes. I think his passing, the passing part of his game is underrated. Uh, I think we'll see that. In Cloton, he didn't play with very good players. And it's funny, the scout that I was taught, one of the scouts that I was uh, standing beside, he's, well, he's more of a director of player personnel, really. So he, like, he he told me that he was getting scouting reports from his guys uh, over in Europe on him this year. And they were just, oh, there's the, there's the goal. Wow. Wow. That was sweet. That dangle. And they'll show the... Uh, They'll show the replay here, but uh, yeah, I love the way he got congratulated too, everybody. Yeah, yeah, even on the bench too. When he got to yeah. the bench, everybody swarmed him. It's too bad that the uh, the replay didn't show the dangle, because he just uh, the dangle that he you know up close, he really dangled a guy at the blue line. It was just you know, as I as I said in uh, as I tweeted out a uh, Mitch Mitch Covey and uh type goal mm. right <laughs> i thought a, that was you know, a good dig up the, yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Just, you know that'd be kind of goal mitch Kov would score right but coming from a 6-3 defenseman that's pretty cool but uh no i loved how he took things into his own hands in the uh, third period and said okay i'll tie this up myself you know mm -hmm. so uh just loved that I mean, oh here it is in overtime and he uh he only I thought it was, I thought it was pretty neat that he uh, he played more than twenty one minutes, PK shorthanded overtime, so he was thrown right into the fire, and uh, acquitted himself just admirably, to say Absolutely. the least. The yeah. scouts beside me, you know, when he scored that goal, look mm, the nod of approval, you know, That's saying, yeah, that was pretty impressive, and it, it sure was. But even there, do you see? where he waited behind the net, you know, he didn't rush it, waited till the guys uh, got open. The poise was uh, was something that impressed me as much as anything. So just, uh, I mean, you couldn't ask for a better AHL debut for a 19-year-old defenseman. I don't think it was, uh, was superlative. Yeah, yeah. And, again, he, he, he was in the lineup again yesterday against Belleville. Uh, no, no points this time, but – you got to watch the game. I tried to find the feed, and, and anyways, AHL makes it a lot more complicated to watch their games. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm relying on your analysis on this one. But from that second game, what, what did you gather uh, from his 
his performance? I uh, wasn't as good as the first game. Yeah, hard to and be. Uh, I mean, you, you're running on adrenaline that first mm -hmm. game, right? And you could tell that he was pumped. <laughs> you know, he had that extra jump. I think just so excited, and maybe uh, don't forget, Cloton. They they might have played about five games in the last month, and all of a sudden he's playing back to back. You know, welcome to uh, North America. And that, and then today it'll be three in a row, three days in less than seventy two hours yeah, too. Yeah, four p.m. against so, the Marlies. You know his legs were likely feeling it. The lactic acid and everything built up. Uh, um, you know, I I don't think he skated as well and had a couple of hiccups during the game, and and of course didn't score a goal. So, I mean, I you know, we're expecting <laughs> yeah. it. We're expecting it every game now, right? Because see. He started off with one, but oh. uh, no, he uh, again, though, overall, big picture, solid again. Um, um, play, played on the PK, played lots of minutes. Um, just want to point out, too, that in the, the game on Friday night, which made it even more impressive, was that uh, Will, Willie Trudeau went down with an injury in the first period. Yeah. So he was paired to start the game with Bisson. And I thought, okay, great. Have him with the vet. You know, they'll get used to each other. Well, that one all went out the window when uh, Trudeau went down. He mm -hmm. so he had to he put, basically played with everybody else, like all <laughs> the rest of the game. So he didn't get used to having a D partner because it it got switched up. He uh, played twenty one. 30 I think it was total for your opening game in you know the AHL mm -hmm. so he was a little tired the legs were a little little tired probably last yesterday and uh he actually even got beat once to the outside where he kind of stumbled on his pivot and got beat but and then he had one Pretty egregious turnover, but it was more of a bobble of a puck than a stupid, stupid play. Yeah. Like if you know, if he hadn't bobbled the puck, it was wouldn't have been a bad play. But he, the pass kind of got bobbled, and it ended up right on the guy's stick, and he went for a breakaway. But that happens to every defenseman, you know. And I tweeted out like, you know, his first egregious error. Expect expect to see more. Right. Every, That's true. Yeah. Every defenseman, especially in the when he gets to the NHL, uh, they're going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's just such great hockey that uh, um, it, everybody will make mistakes. Every great defenseman, every average defenseman, every poor defenseman. So uh, it, just don't get too caught up on it, on them, and um, just as you don't get overly hyped by a great offensive play or oh, whatever don't get too concerned about the odd mistake that's it because you have to make the mistakes in order to learn from them right so these are learning opportunities right mm -hmm. now for david it's fantastic right he he, he learned from that for sure he's not going to make that same mistake again so uh and, and he's a smart kid so he, already he's not going to make a ton of mistakes right he's he's already at an ahl level from from the get-go which is all, even more encouraging than we could have hoped for, I think. So uh, that's that's really the bottom line, right? You, like you mentioned, temper ups expectations. He's not going to score a nice goal every game, but he's not going to make those mistakes every game either. He's going to be, you know, right. somewhere in that middle, and that middle is is excellent. I mean, he's he, he does pretty much everything right from what you, you you've been telling us. So uh, I think Habs fans should should rejoice. Uh, <laughs> from what I've seen on social media, they are pretty happy, but. Um, I did see a clip from last last night's game where you know he got he got a little chippy, right? He's got he's got a little bit of grit to him there, a little scuffle in front of the net, and and he was one of the last ones to let go. So, uh, what would you think about that one? Yeah, well, we saw it in Cloton a couple times this year too. He's not yeah. uh, going to take uh, too much guff, but the the fact that it was a Imama as well, who is you know, it's a large man. <laughs> yeah, a one large tough man, one tough customer. You know, yeah. um, so, uh, yeah, he gave him a little shot there. 
like Imama was kind of engaged with someone else and Reinbacher got a free one in there. And then another guy came in, hey, don't, you know, protecting yeah. Imama or whatever, which I thought was kind of funny. But uh, then he, you know, exchanged a couple of shots with him as well. So, no, he's, uh, yeah. And I mean, as he gets stronger and older, I think you'll just see more and more of that. He's, he, he'll play with an edge. And that's not a bad thing either, you know. So uh, it, it, it very encouraging. I mean, the right side. Well, we've got a clip of uh, another right defenseman that uh, did okay uh, on Friday night as well. May you with the uh, with the overtime winner. I mean, I, I tweeted out that. Uh, do we have that clip, guys? Uh, I tweeted out that. Uh, that uh, <laughs> um, he's going to play in the NHL for a long time, and he is. I mean, he just stood out. Mm. Perfect shot. Um, he stood out above uh, everybody, I thought. He was the best player on the ice. Wow. Um, I had not seen him playing in a AHL this season yet, so just thoroughly impressed by uh, how he uh, – handled himself, especially defensively. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very physical on Imama during the game too. And there were a couple of times where he just, uh, like, he's a heavy, strong, heavy kid. And it, uh, and a guy went in the corner with him and he gave him the old, just gave him a shove and it was like, ooh, that, you know, that kid can bench press 300 pounds probably. <laughs> he's uh, he's oh, strong. Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. really strong. So, uh the, he's got a physical edge to his game too. So there's two big mobile physical defensemen on their way over the next two years to the Canadians that, mm. that are, you know, just going to increase their uh, talent level, their skill level, their uh, size, just, you know, all the components that you like to see, like the Canadians are doing it right. They're going to have a defense core that's similar to like Vegas. Oh and the Vegas, I think that was the key to their victory last year was Absolutely. that defense core. Yeah. And Montreal's trying to build in that mold. And I think it's the right approach. For, for sure. hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, you know, <laughs> You, when you talk about Mayu, the one thing that came to mind was when Rocco says, you know, nothing pisses him off more than a big body, soft player, right? A, a big body player who doesn't use his big body. And, and these two guys have big bodies and they use them, right? So uh, it's, it's, it's all the more encouraging against, against grown men too. Let's, let's not forget, right? The AHL players are, are, you know, NHL size, right? So already they have that kind of physicality in their game. Uh, it's yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think if you're Habs fans, you, you, you got to be pretty happy about that. Uh, but sticking on Mayu for a second, right? That goal gave him the record for the most goals for a defenseman, not, not just a rookie, a defenseman in Laval rocket history in a season. If, yeah. But he's a rookie. I mean, you know what I mean? Like he, it's well, his first season pro. It's pretty absurd what he's been able yeah, to do. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. not like they have a 50 year history or something like that, but yeah. Still. Right, the fact well, that he is a rookie and he broke that record, I think, deserves some some recognition because that's pretty impressive. Yes, and I asked him how you pronounce his name, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, when I interviewed him in the summer. And I know a lot of the French media because my M A I L L is pronounced my for French uh, names as mm -hmm. a rule, but it's Mayu is how he, uh, you know. I mean, he grew up in Southern Ontario, right? So we all have our slats on, on lights. But just, I, I see a lot of people saying Mayu and it, it's Logan Mayu is is the correct, correct pronunciation on him. So mm -hmm. all we'll, right. we'll go with, if you don't mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're, we'll try to get people swayed into how, you know, how he likes it pronounced anyways. Uh, um, Logan is a... Uh, is a fantastic, fantastic player. And uh, what I, what I like is that he got three, I think it was, uh, he's third overall in rookie scoring or fourth after last night, he, he got up to fourth. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a defenseman, 
and he's third in defense scoring in uh, in the AHL as a rookie. Um, I mean, that's incredible for a, a rookie defenseman to come in and to be top four in both categories. Yeah. And also, you you have to see you have to see that uh, Reinbacher. I think that there's offensive potential that because he's he was playing in Europe on a team that didn't have a lot of talent. Um, he he could have had a lot more points this year if he'd had more skilled players to play with, and we see we saw that um, just even in that game that he's going to have more talent to play with in the AHL and certainly in the NHL and that you're going to see more offense from him and the points will come as he, as he matures. Uh, he's got a good shot. He, he can skate, carry the puck and he's smart, good vision, all of that. So the, all of the pieces are in place for him to be able to produce uh, at the pro level. Mm -hmm. So, very encouraging, very encouraging that uh, that he um, picked up a goal in his first game, and I think it's just the first of many to come. So, oh, definitely, definitely the way the way he shot that, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if we saw a few more by the end of the season. Um, so, I mean, we're sticking on the right side here, right? You got Mayu, who's who's the general, right? He's the quarterback of this team. It's it's pretty obvious now, and then you add. Ryan Backer, who's a fantastic young player, but there's a there's another guy on the right side here, Justin Barron. Uh, it seems like the fan base has maybe given up on him, uh, or they they disregard him, right? Maybe he doesn't have a future in the NHL. It's it's hard to gauge, right? Because we see these flashes whenever he's called up to the Habs, he goes on these two to three game spans where he's like the best defenseman, <laughs> and then after that, he's he's invisible, right? So it's just finding that consistency for him. What did you notice out of Justin Barron when you when you saw him there? Well, I spoke to him, and he likes to have his name pronounced. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> Baron? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I probably shouldn't have got off on that tangent, but I just I see uh, uh, a, a lot of the, the media calls him Mayu, and I mean, for what it's worth, he, he pronounces it Mayu. But uh, no, Justin Barron... Um, is uh he's in tough like uh i don't it it'll be interesting to see what happens with david savard um will they bring him back after next year will they trade him next year it a lot will depend on whether they're in the playoff race i think because if they are you got to keep them you know it's gonna be tough to trade them uh they might even consider extending them um, you know, for a year or two. I mean, the, he loves Montreal, right? Uh, loves playing there. Uh, Justin Barron is, it looks pretty decent at the HL level. He, like he's got the skating ability. He's got some offensive ability, good size. Um, I think he's, um, uh, right now he's kind of a cusper, you know, Yeah. good AHL player, but not, Maybe makes too many mistakes under pressure at the uh, at the NHL level, um, and that's been a, kind of the knock on him, even going back to junior. That under pressure, he uh, still finds the game a little too fast at times, and 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 is prone to mistakes. And he'll have to get over that because uh, NHL coaches. Are, are pretty impatient when it comes to, uh, um, you know, yeah. turnovers, costly turnovers. Uh, they won't put up with too many, especially when there's other guys that come in and take your place. So, um, I it, like right now, may use ahead of them on the death chart. I think, yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Uh, Reinbacher, well, if he isn't. He's soon going to be ahead of him on the depth chart. <laughs> Matter of time. Yeah. Savard's ahead of him on the depth chart. Uh, Kovacevic is a better NHL defenseman right now. Gooley's playing on the right side. Um, I mean, you start doing the math, hmm. and uh, unless they trade somebody in the offseason, 
it could be Baron that gets traded, to be honest with you. You might see him. And I think on a, you know, in an organization where there's not as much depth, especially on the right side, and there's lots of them, Baron will be a uh, an attractive piece. Uh, yeah. He may not fetch a top six winger, which is kind of what the Canadians are, are hoping to get. You might have to throw something else in on a package, but wouldn't surprise me if Barron got uh, got shopped at some point and perhaps just because, you know, of numbers, uh, ends up playing – on another uh on another team it's interesting that there were pro scouts at that game uh were they there to look at baron maybe you know i mean pro scout nhl teams know that montreal's got got great depth uh on defense and yeah. guys coming angstrom and hudson two more you know like the numbers are tell you that Montreal is going to have defensemen available. So uh wouldn't surprise me if Barron ended up elsewhere down the down the road because I just don't think that uh I think the other guys are there's too many guys ahead of him and that he'll have trouble cracking the lineup. Yeah, it's it's at least it's a good problem to have, right? In a sense yeah. where okay, you, you got this defenseman who who has this upside that we've seen. Uh, he, he's demonstrated some great things at, at, even at the NHL level, but finding that consistency seems to be a bit harder for him. And if he does, you have three really really strong defensemen on the right side. So uh, again, not not a terrible problem to have when <laughs> for the Habs there. Uh, before we get to some questions, we have a few in the chat already, um, and, and feel free to send some more. We'll, we'll get to them if we can, but I want to ask you about two other guys on, on the rocket, two new players, right? Jacob Perrault and Zurado, who are, are, are still, you know, figuring it out in, in Laval, not making a whole lot happening so far, but I want to get your thoughts, seeing them live, what, what, what you thought of their game. Um... I wasn't overly impressed with either on Friday night. Um, I don't know, like, the physical end of the game. I think right now they're still adjusting to uh, AHL men's strength. I, I think both of them are a little maybe, uh, you know, below average when it comes to strength in the AHL. Uh, I think they both need to get stronger still. Now, Perot especially is not that old, so you you got to hope that he has a good, strong off season, puts on right. some some more muscle, and comes back maybe in a little better shape than than he is at, right now. Uh, they both had, they both were knocked off the puck and and had some bad turnovers during the game, uh, a couple of instances, and Durando didn't dress for. Uh, Yesterday's game, yeah. you know, they brought in Kidney, who I think probably is a better, better player at this point. Certainly a better prospect, I think. Okay. But uh, I mean, they traded for these guys, and the hope is that they will uh, find their games because I think they both struggled this year where they were playing. And I mean, it's obvious why now that I I've seen them that they're. They're not on top of their games 100% right now. Part of it might be that they weren't playing a lot and they need to get into game shape more, you know. Uh, I think good, solid off-seasons, training, get a little stronger, get a little quicker. They both have offensive talent. Uh, certainly Perot in, in junior, uh, great shot, good puck skills, good offensive skills, but... Uh, Boy, I mean, he didn't get – if you're not getting any chances to shoot, it doesn't really matter if you have a great shot or not. And no. he wasn't accomplishing a heck of a lot in that game. So, But there's an adjustment period for guys coming to a new team. Find your role. Find your uh, – get used to teammates and stuff, and hopefully their games uh, improve as, as it goes along here down the stretch. That's They're going to need them. 
Yeah, the playoff push is is full on right now. I mean, they they just passed yeah. Belleville, so they are in a playoff spot, but it's very very tight. So these next yeah. few games are critical, and then if they do make it to the playoffs, you you need that offensive output from those guys. So I think that's that's why they traded for them. Uh, the potential is there for for a lot of you know offensive output, but for now, I mean, it's it's an adjustment period. Uh, it's you know, like you said, Peru is still young, right? So uh, you can't expect the world out of him, but at some point it's got to come, right? So yeah, uh, yeah. Hopefully, well, he's not than playing later. like a first. He's not playing like a first round draft pick at this point, you know. <laughs> like no, I can tell why Anaheim gave up on him, but I mean, he was picked in the first round. He's young, uh, you know. It, it's it's certainly not too too late for him to evolve into a a decent prospect that maybe down the road could get an NHL shot. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, the Canadians are, um, uh, they've also got, uh, Engstrom and Kapanen who it's funny. They, Kapanen, my God. they, yeah, Kapanen's had a terrific, uh, playoff. Yeah. Yeah. Could be player of the week again, this coming week with the recruits draft cast. But, uh, I was week. speaking with somebody in the uh, Canadians organization at the, uh, at the game, and it sounds like Kapanen's probably not. I don't think they're expecting Kapanen to come over uh, to play in Laval at the end of his playoff uh, mm-hmm. in in Liga, which is unfortunate because I think they could use him. I think he could be a top three center on the on the uh, Rocket right now. Um, yeah, I mean he's might be arguably the best player in Liga the past month. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, 23 points in his last 20 games. I mean, there's one, two point per game players in the entire league. It's a low scoring league. So, and how many he, game winning goals out of that, right? He's wow. clutch. This guy's clutch. Four playoff games, three game winning goals, and a game tying goal. Hello. Not bad, right? huh. it, it reminds me of the run that Lekkonen went on at the same age in, in Liga. Quite the you player know. he's become. And so. <laughs> yeah, he became a heck of a player. So yeah, Stanley Cup Captain champion. Bigger. He's a center. I mean, there's a lot of value there. So they've got a great piece there. But I think the expectation is that Engstrom will come over when when his playoffs is over. That'd be big. Yeah, that would be you big. You know, um, add him to the, 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 the top six in Laval, the defense, you know, like you'd have to take out Gallipo probably. Wow. And he's a pretty steady AHL defenseman. So the, it, yeah, it'd be a young group, but boy, a lot of talent, size, um, defending just, uh, I, I really do think that, but the thing is too, that both of those guys, uh, they're up to nothing in their series uh, against teams <laughs> yeah. that first and second place teams. And they were seventh in rank place teams. Well, they went into the other team's building one two games, so they're going back home up to nothing. Possibility uh, is that they win that series and and they keep going. So we may, may not see Engstrom for a while, which is a which isn't a terrible thing. I mean, you want them, yeah, you want them to get that playoff experience and especially SHL and Liga, very good hockey. There's some good teams, and that's who they're facing. Are mm-hmm. good teams right now, so it, it, it's good for their, uh, you know, for them down the road and their development to be uh, going on good playoff runs in Europe. That's right. Very, very much unlike David Reinbacker and Cloton, who was on the worst team and and not getting any playoff experience. So now he's in a much better situation, and and he's obviously benefiting from it. Uh, and and another thing too, I mean. It's it's been confirmed and reported that a lot of the players on that team have kind of adopted him. You know, they all want to go out with to dinner with him. They, they've kind of brought him into the fold. So that's really great to see. It speaks on the leadership in that locker room and, and the coaching staff as well for eliciting that that leadership and, and those initiatives. So props to the players on Laval for making him feel at home. Uh, seems like it's working. Yeah. Seems like it's working. They yeah. already, um, they already gave him a, they already gave him a nickname, Rhino. Which I there mean, we go. That wasn't yeah. 
that wasn't their stretch. It was funny. The, <laughs> They're not the AHL, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The AHL broadcaster yesterday, um, the, uh, the Sens, I was listening to the Sens uh, broadcaster, and they, they've got a player named Reinhardt, and they, they were calling him Rhino. So it was Rhino versus Rhino yesterday. Uh, well, I think we know which one's better. So anyways, we'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. And we'll get to some fan questions here. We got Filterless Bear who wants to know about Florian Jacka. He thinks that he's got tons of potential and could be a middle six power forward. What do you think about oh. that, Brent? Had that chat on uh, Tony's podcast before about him maybe switching to the and it got a lot of feedback. Boy, you don't switch him to forward. He, you know, why would you do that? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, we're um, talking Florian, not uh, not Arbor. Yeah. Oh, Florian. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Florian. <laughs> the, the, the deputy, right. not many, the sheriff. Too many yeah. jack eyes. That's it. Yeah. It's a good problem to have, though. <laughs> you yeah. can't have too many jack eyes. Yeah, right. Um, Florian jack eye, middle six. I think ideally... Uh, you probably want him in a fourth or third or fourth line role, mm-hmm. bottom six. I don't see him. I don't see second line potential there. Not on a contender, at least you know. Um, yeah, he produced at the junior level this year, but I don't really think he's got top six NHL potential. Now, um, big kid. I'd love to see him uh, win a. I think Montreal doesn't have a lot of players like him in the system. That's it. Now it's one of the reasons why. It's one of the reasons why I'd like them to sign Luke Tuck. I don't know if they will or not, but because they don't have many big, mobile, uh, physical forwards in the system, so um, I, I can see him. Ideally, I think on a contender, you're looking at at uh, Florian Jacki being a uh, all-purpose fourth liner at mm-hmm. the NHL level that can chip in some points, that can fight, that can uh, play wing, he can play center, um, just an all-purpose utility guy at, who also could fill in on the third line and not look out of place. That type of player, I think. I think that's his NHL potential. And I mean, he's a mid round draft pick, right? Typically, I mean, the expectations aren't, aren't any higher than that. You've got a pile, you've got 15 forwards drafted in the past five years ahead of him in the system. And the expectation will be that nine will, you know, nine will surpass him or be ahead of him on the depth chart, but right. never say never. He might be, uh, become a middle line forward. Uh, he's certainly beaten the odds so far, you yeah. know, um, not drafted his first year of eligibility, then getting drafted, just, uh, improving his game exponentially, just like his older brother. And, um, uh, if that improvement keeps on just like it did with, uh, with Arbor, uh, after the age of 19, we saw the, t- the jump that he made two straight years. Well, you know, th- I'm not going to put a tap on his potential. It's, it's, uh, I think he's got, I think he's got NHL potential. And for a fourth round pick, that's, that's great. Exactly. Great, great value there. And as, <laughs> if you, if you can reunite the Bash brothers together, uh, that could that could do some damage, especially come playoff time. You do not want to be playing against them, so it's a good thing to have them on your team, right? Uh, so Florian Jacka, yeah, it's it's an interesting prospect. Again, I think expectations are tempered with him, which which could benefit him actually, right? He, him not being a first round pick um, could could play in his favor, right? Being a fourth rounder, you know, most f- fourth rounder don't even make it to the NHL, so if he does. He's already winning. Uh, it's it's looking like a, a, a better and better pick every day. Um, all right, we got Lebowski here who wants to know what are the main differences between Artem Levshunov and Carter Yakimchuk, according mm. to Grant? That's a good question. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if 
one of them gets drafted by the Canadians, believe it or not. Ooh. Uh, Cause yeah. that's, I, I mean, if the top four forwards are gone, when Montreal picks or three, you know, uh, the next guys on most lists are going to be defensemen, a few of them. So uh, wouldn't shock me if the Canadians picked one of those two and imagine having, you know, Yakum Chuck, Reinbacher, and Mayu as your top three defensemen down the road. Hello. Uh, I mean, oh. what would be neat is that none of them would garner big contracts for a while, so right. they wouldn't be taking up a huge amount of your of your cap space, especially uh, you know if one or two of them are on entry level contracts for a year or two, and in the NHL, and you've got a top six defense core that's only costing you a few million dollars on your cap space and you can spend that money up front. Like the, the team could uh, contend in a hurry mm -hmm. with, with that scenario. So, and then you trade other defensemen, right? You trade yep. a, a Baron, you trade wh whoever, you know, two or three of them and get the pieces that you're, that you want to find up front to go, to go with them. So, I think they take the best player available in the draft, regardless whether it's a defenseman or a forward, because defensemen have great asset value. You saw what Drysdale fetched, right? Cutter Goche. Huge. Yeah. Who was amazing again last night, you know? Oh. So you can always trade defensemen down the road. Mm -hmm. You're drafting for three, four years down the road. You're not drafting for tomorrow. So, um, and like I say, it could be one of those two. I watched um, I watched Lev Shunov last night. Uh, I caught the overtime. Michigan State and Michigan. Um, Michigan was heavy, heavy on the forecheck, and actually he he turned over the puck two or three times and uh, was uh, heavy under pressure. I think there's some work to do on his game. I'm not crazy about him defensively. Mm -hmm. I think Yakumchuk has more offensive capability. For me, I know uh, probably most lists or a lot of lists have left Shunov ahead of Yakumchuk, but for me, it's the opposite. Um, where Lev Shunov has the edge on him is he's a better skater, and th and that's probably why a lot of guys have him ranked ahead of him but for me i think yakin chuck has more offensive upside and more defensive upside he's oh, yeah. uh he's more physical he makes less mistakes especially under pressure um better puck handler i think his shot is better at the end of the day so everything for me with yakin chuck aside from the skating is just a little better so if it came down to, uh, you know, the top forwards are gone, Lindstrom, Celebrini, and... Uh, Demidov. Yeah. Demidov. Uh, for, for me, well, Perek, obviously... That's assuming, he, yeah, he's not going to be there. <laughs> he's not going to be there. Overall three of them, but Yakumchuk. Oh, Reinbacher, Yakumchuk, and uh, Mayu. All Come six, on. three plus, Come all, on. you know, all good defenders, all uh, offensive capability. It'd be just sick. So uh, yeah. I, I wouldn't mind it if they took Yak and Chuck at all. No, that's it. Best player available. I think nobody can, can argue against that. Even though the Habs are loaded at D, you know, you take the best guy available. And if that's Yak and Chuck, I think Habs fans should rejoice uh another one here from steven before we head off uh, a few more questions after that he's asking uh so he's he's eyeing cole baudouin and just juste poirier with that Jets first rounder this year what does grant think of those two players Ooh, um justin poirier is not going in the first round hmm. i don't know that he goes in the top three rounds to be honest with you 
Oh. Maybe I don't think he goes in the top two rounds. Uh, probably a third or fourth rounder. He's five nine and a bit, not a great skater. And yeah, he's scoring lots of goals in the queue. He's he's gritty for his size. He's a sniper uh, at the junior level, but as far as that translating to the NHL, to him being a top six forward, you're you're. Uh, uh, it, it's uh, I just don't see it being some. At this point, I don't know any NHL scouts that have him high, that highly ranked. Mm -hmm. So, no, I don't. I don't think the Canadians will be taking uh, a five nine uh, forward that doesn't skate that well with a first round pick. They already have enough smaller forwards in the organization, and for that, for those reasons, I don't think that he'll be a consideration in the first round. But hey, if he's there in the third, well, you know, take a flyer out. I mean, he's a he just. Uh, Kept scoring this year, you know, scoring yeah. at the HL or at the uh, QMJHL level. So um, there'll probably be a team that come the third round, if he's still there, we'll, we'll grab him. And maybe it's the Canadians. I know. Uh, Cole Baudoir, yeah. I can see the, uh, the Canadians targeting him with their, uh, with their Jets pick. That's a very good choice by the, uh, by the person asking the question um he uh big um smart tremendous work ethic and very physical very physical he's uh one of the more highly competitive players in this draft class i've heard him compared to uh boone jenner now it's not a perfect comparison but yeah. that type of player would be uh just a perfect Good. addition to your third line down the mm -hmm. road. And uh, just like Poirier, he's got to work on his skating too, but he's six to 210 pounds. So, you know, you make up for it in determination in other ways, as far as translating your game to the NHL level, not saying that Poirier can't do that, but the majority of scouts at this point, I don't think, are that high on Poirier. It's certainly not as high as they are on Baudouin. Mm -hmm. And um, his skating has improved as the year goes along. We'll likely see him at the uh, at the U18s, and that'll be a big, you know, I think that'll make or break whether he's a first-round pick or not. And um, if he shows that he can handle the pace at the, at the U18s at the end of the year, I wouldn't be surprised if he's... Uh, one of the players that the Canadians look seriously at with the Winnipeg pick. That's interesting. And that's assuming the pick doesn't get traded, right? Uh, we saw last year they traded a first and a second for Alex Newhook. And and I know that Jeff Gorton has has mentioned on the SIG podcast, the eye test with Pierre Maguire and Jimmy Murphy, that they are open on adding talent. And if if there's a trade that that appears before them that could you know, facilitate that, then, you know, they'd, they'd be open to it. So uh, again, that's another possibility, right? Uh, trading that pick. Now, I think we can take uh, another question here before we head off. I'll, uh, I'll let Sammy pick a question from Twitter. Uh, we, we had a few questions from Twitter earlier. So uh, Rick here is asking, after a few drafts of the new Habs regime, what do you think are the main qualities the scouting team look for in a player? Very good question. Yeah. Well, um, I think hockey sense is a is, is at the. You look at uh, a lot of the guys picked: Owen Beck, Lane Hudson, uh, Slav, Meshar, um, Engstrom. Well, that was the the one before. I think you, what you can do though, and I, I and I think you have to go back a couple of years before these guys were here because Marty Lapointe is the, you know, he was, he was with Timmins and, and Bergevin and he's still one of the main decision makers when it comes to the draft. And I think what we saw at the tail end of uh, Bergevin's regime and, and as continued is that 
the Canadians are picking smart, competitive players. Uh, and uh, I think Marty has a lot to do with that. Um, Kapanen, I mean, you go down the list of guys taken in the last four years, and hockey sense is a very key component to most of them. Uh, you know, that goes for Reinbacher, um, uh, you know, and and competitiveness for all these guys. Uh, Fowler is another example. Uh, Jack I, very competitive. Um, and when I spoke with Marty in the off season and asked him about, you know, what what do you look for most in a, in a player? And he said competitiveness. So I think competitiveness and um if you're competitive and uh you know very smart a smart ho hockey iq marty marty's gonna love you i think bob rov obviously i mean how can you not like those qualities in a in a player yeah. right so um i think that those are the two main uh, components that they're looking for in building a team and an identity and a culture, mm -hmm. but obviously you want skill too. So you get those three components along with decent size. Cause I think we've seen the new guys, they went out and got doc. They, they picked Sla first overall. They took the six, three defenseman over the five ten winger uh, fifth overall last year. It's telling you that they think that the team needs to be bigger to compete for a Stanley Cup. And uh, those are the three things that I think that the uh, the new regime is placing a high priority on. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I would agree. Uh, hockey sense, right? It's it's all in the peanut. You know what I mean? They're, they're drafting good character, smart players. And to me, that's, that's in the making for... Uh, a, a, a successful recipe right there. Uh, very, very happy as a Habs fan myself, right? I'm, I'm thrilled with what they've accomplished through the draft in, in only two, two drafts so far. Right. So um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very, very excited to see what they do in this year's draft, having two first round picks, the, the depth, right. The depth of prospects in this year, this year is, is very, very exciting. So uh, they have a lot of options. It's going to be hard to screw up, right? Whoever they pick in that top five, top six pick, I think it. You know, <laughs> there's so many options that you you just have to be happy with whoever they pick and trust that that was the best player available. Um, we've gone on for quite some time, and honestly, I had a ton of fun, Grant. I love going live, yeah. and if you enjoyed us going live and want us to do it again, let us know in the comments. Um, we might do it again. Who knows? Uh, don't forget to subscribe. Give us a like, right? Uh, this this channel is only possible because of you. Uh, we, we appreciate all of your support. And uh, obviously, if you want the full report on what Grant thought about David Reinbacker, head over to recruits.ca. Grant wrote a, a fantastic article about that. So uh, do yourself a favor. Go check that out. Grant, any parting remarks from you? I thought my phone was turned off. Apparently not. <laughs> Got the little uh, ding -de -ding. something something from man yellow so yeah you ah, couldn't hold you, off for 20 seconds i'll have to i'll have to tune them in when we get off the air <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's good all right well thank you everybody for tuning in i hope you have a fantastic week and uh, we'll see you in the next one take care and that's a wrap hope you don't miss us too much until next time Follow the Sick Podcast Recruits Draftcast on YouTube, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.